Welcome, welcome to another edition of Clouds of Torah Presents. Did Jesus fulfill Zechariah 9 and 9? This is yet again another false fulfillment citation, again by Matthew. He has probably the most out of any book of the Gospels. Um, we're going to deal with it um, verse for verse, Zechariah 9 and 9. <clears throat> and here is the context of how Matthew uses it to uh, describe how Jesus fulfilled it. So if we go to Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her so a donkey and a colt with her okay loose them and bring them to me and if anyone says anything to you to you you shall say the lord has need of them and immediately he will send them all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying tell the daughter of zion behold your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey a colt the fowl of a donkey so the disciples went and did as jesus commanded them they brought the donkey and the colt laid their clothes on them and set him on them and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So, does Zechariah 9 and 9 describe such an event? Well, yes and no. It does tell us that a king will come lowly and riding on a donkey. It tells us here, Jesus rode on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, is he riding on two animals? Because that's the way Matthew describes it, right? It says, you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me, right? The Lord has need of them, right? <laughs> so, um, is riding on a donkey a prophecy about a Messiah coming? It's part of one. But is that all there is to it? Let's find out. So pay attention specifically to where the quote is. Matthew 21, 4 through 5. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's it. Is that all that um, Zechariah 9 and 9 says? What about verses 8 and verses 10? Or are we just going to cherry pick that he rode on a donkey? Let's see. Riding on a donkey, huh? Is that it? Zechariah 9 and 9. The NIV says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The word English Bible says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king comes to you, he is righteous and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So righteous and victorious, um, and or righteous and having salvation. 
Well, if Jesus is just riding into Jerusalem, he hasn't died yet. He's done a few miracles. I don't know how he would be classified as victorious by the NIV. And uh, in um, the World English Bible, it said he is righteous and having salvation. Nobody was saved. Actually, he says he who endures to the end will be saved. So I don't know how he had salvation when, according to the book of Hebrews, he isn't supposed to bring salvation until he returns. So when exactly is the prophecy fulfilled? Was it just because he rode on that donkey or these other things he has to do when he returns, you know, the victorious and the salvation part? And we're going to see if he was, in fact, righteous. Let's see. First, why is riding on a donkey important to begin with? Well, let's go to the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 33 through 35. And it says, the king also said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him and he shall come up. He shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. So here we have King David. King David telling the people um, to have the priest and the prophet take Solomon down in front of everybody and anoint him. Well, not everybody because everybody wasn't there, but uh, take him down to Gihon and um anoint him king over Israel, over Israel and Judah. And in 1 Kings 1 and 39, then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon and they blew the horn and all the people said, long live King Solomon. So we see that Solomon was told to ride on David's mule. This is important for the kings of Israel because the king's sons rode on donkeys or mules. So this was a sign of royalty. Um, he was specifically anointed by a priest with a horn of oil from the tabernacle. Nobody spoke to Solomon out of the sky. Um, no woman who was a sinner or a prostitute put oil on his feet or nothing like that. Um, specifically says that a priest took oil oil from the tabernacle and made Solomon king. So those who know the story in the New Testament, we know that no prophet anointed Jesus with any oil from the tabernacle, although they had a temple, they had priests, but this is not how Jesus was said to be anointed in the New Testament. And he didn't ride on a king's donkey. He rode on the donkey that he told them to go get from. We really don't know who it, who it was. It just says go to a place and get a donkey. So I don't know um, if that person had any type of ruling authority or anything of that nature. But let's continue. The king's mule. First Kings 1 and 44. The king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they have made him ride on the king's mule. 2 Samuel 16 and 2. And the king said unto Ziba, What meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, The asses be for the king's household to ride on. So I just want to clarify why that's important of any king of Judah or Israel riding on a donkey or a mule has signified their authority and this was what the king's sons did. Your king comes to you. John 6 15. Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So if he was the king 
why didn't he want to be the king when the people wanted to make him king? So some people say, well, it wasn't his time yet. Okay. John 12 and 15 says, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. So later on in John, he's okay with them praying him as the king, right? They go get branches and make a whole uh, festivity out of it, right? But when he comes before the governor, Matthew 27 and 11, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, it is as you say, or, you know, whatever you said, right? So in John 18, 36, as the conversation between Jesus and the governor or Pilate continues, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. So if your kingdom is not of this world, who are you the king of? Not the people of this world, because they proclaimed you a son of David, a king of Judah or Israel, right? You in Jerusalem, that's where the king reigned from, <clears throat> right? The city of David's in Zion. So why would you not be the king of this world? Is that because Herod was really the king of Judea? Isn't Herod really on your throne? Jesus, if you are the king, if it says your king comes to you, but you're not the king, your kingdom is not of this world, then what's going on? Are the people to believe that they have a king that that they can see, but he's really not the, the king of this world, right? Didn't he tell them the kingdom of God is in your midst? It's It's within you. It's here. The time is fulfilled. Right. So I don't know how he could be the king coming to you if his kingdom is not of this world. Who was the king of Judea? Luke 1 and 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. So Herod was really the king of Judea. Now, this was, you know, when Jesus was a baby, of course, was he actually in this verse, he wasn't even born yet. But we know at that time, there was already a king in Judea, right? Then if we fast forward in the same book, Luke 23, 11, then Herod, now we know there was multiple Herods, but there's another king, Herod, it says, then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. So the real king of Judea mocked him, ridiculed him, and dressed him up and sent him to Pilate to be crucified, right? So it's weird that Jesus is called a king, right? But the real king of Judea clowns him and sends him to be killed. Is that what the king was coming to do in Zechariah 9 and 9? If you're just reading Zechariah 9, that he's just supposed to come and ride on the donkey, then the answer would be, I guess so. Because it just, well, actually not, because it does say that he is righteous and having salvation or righteous and victorious well that right there doesn't sound like a, a victorious thing to be mocked and ridiculed and dressed up and sent to be killed there's no victory there um so i think herod won that match so in john 19 15 but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, the chief priests are Sadducees. So they're Jews who really don't even believe in the Torah in its full capacity. <clears throat> they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels and things like that. Like there's parts of the, of the Tanakh they reject. So. These chief priests saying we have no king but Caesar, it doesn't even really matter because they're not even, you know, kosher, for lack of a better word, Jews um, to be, you know, getting an answer from or a response from. 
But in reality, there was a Caesar. And he was really the overall ruler of the place because we even know that Jesus said, whose image is on the money, right? Give Caesar's things to Caesar. But if Jesus was really the king, like David or somebody like that, in his land of Israel, I don't think David would have been paying money or taxes to somebody in his land if he really was the king. That would mean you're really not the king or you would be a subservient king, right? Uh, like a vassal state type of a king who really doesn't have all the authority. You got some authority granted to you by the real king or power of that land. So your king comes to you really doesn't fit Jesus in the capacity that Zechariah 9 and 9 and 10 because the preceding verses and the verses after tell a whole nother story of what this king is going to do. And I'm going to show you that. So when it says your king comes to you and he is righteous. So let's deal with this. And this is just one of the things uh, I don't want to get too deep into it, but let's let's talk about this real quick. So Jesus fasted, but his disciples cannot. Right. Matthew 9, 14 through 15, then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then they shall fast. So in Matthew 6 and 16, he's talking about when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So we know people were used to fasting, whether it be a personal fast, something decreed by the prophets. You got Yom Kippur. You got the Pharisees fasting on different occasions. Jesus himself is fasting in Matthew 4 and 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. So Jesus can fast. The disciples of John are fasting. The Pharisees are fasting, but his disciples cannot. Because Jesus is alive. He's basically just saying, while I'm with them, they can't fast or mourn because I'm with them. And then when I'm gone, then they can fast. But didn't he say that you got to listen to the Pharisees? John and his people's doing it. And doesn't John have the Holy Spirit? That's what it says, right? John the Baptist said, says he had the Holy Spirit. So he, he doesn't have a problem with fasting, right? Just like the Pharisees. So what's going on here? Is it righteous to keep people from fasting? Let's see. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Matthew 23, 1 through 3. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Okay. Do as I say, not as I do. Okay. That's basically what he's getting across. So if the Pharisees and the disciples of John are fasting, that means that the Pharisees would encourage people to fast like they're doing because of either a decree that they gave or them enforcing the law of Moses because they sit in Moses' seat, right? Luke 18, 11 through 12, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So it's not clear if he's fasting twice a week because he's a Pharisee and that's exactly what the Pharisees do or him being a Pharisee decreed upon himself that he would fast twice a week. This verse really doesn't tell us that information. Um, but the, the, the fact is he is a fa he's fasting. And we know that there's other fast days. 
So if the disciples of Jesus cannot fast, that means they would not be listening to the Pharisees who sit in Moses' seat. So we know there's different fast days. Zechariah 8 and 19, thus said the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Now, in the written Torah, only Yom Kippur in the seventh month is the decreed in the law to be a fast day. So the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the tenth will be what people will refer to as rabbinical decrees, which would fall under the Pharisees, right? This is what the Pharisees would have decreed, even though the Pharisees are not mentioned in the Tanakh, but we know that these are rabbis. So if they sit in the seat of Moses, and they had the power to decree these fasts recognized by Zechariah 8 and 19. And without the oral Torah, there's really no way to find out when these fasts occurred and when they got instituted, right? Sp specifically, and what specific type of fast was it? Was it a full fast? How long was the fast? It really doesn't tell us all the information in the written Tanakh. So we also have Leviticus 23 and 29. Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. So we know in the Torah, we got the Yom Kippur. And then in the Tanakh, we got other fast days mentioned. We even know that Ezra decreed fast days when they were coming out of Babylon to, to get supplication and, and to pray to the Most High for guidance on specific rulings that they had to make. So we see, we know because of in uh, Deuteronomy 17, it tells you when you have a, a issue that you can't decide, you go to the judges in those days. So the Pharisees or the rabbis or the, the people in authority in those days have the authority to make or decree a fast day. We see in Acts 27 and 9. Now, when much time had been spent and selling was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them. So even after Jesus, we see Yom Kippur still being observed. So the whole time Jesus was preaching, so, so roughly three years, is it that his disciples could not fast? Wouldn't that be breaking all these fast days, especially Yom Kippur itself? Because it doesn't say they can fast except on Yom Kippur. It says as long as he was with them, they could not fast. So for three years, they didn't keep Yom Kippur. And for three years, they did not fast the fast of the fourth, the fifth, or the tenth. And of course, you know, the fast of the seventh would have been Yom Kippur. So it's interesting that he will be called righteous when he would be basically having other people commit sins that will get them cut off from their people and disobeying the Pharisees at the same time. So your king comes to you righteous, already those don't fit because he wasn't a king and he wasn't so righteous but by getting people to break the law, right? I mean... I'm not I'm not seeing how that was 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 a righteous thing to get people to actually break the law after you told them they got to listen to the Pharisees. After he says not one part of the law shall fail until all things be fulfilled. Right. Not one dot, one tittle. You didn't came. You didn't come to change the law or the prophets. Right. If you didn't come to change things then why are you having your disciples not obey the law or the Pharisees that you told them to obey? Okay, so I don't see that as being so righteous. Because of your unbelief, because of your unbelief or because they did not fast and pray, 
Is this why they could not cast out a demon? So this is very interesting. So check this out, Matthew 17, 14 through 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he fallen, he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. He's talking about his disciples here. He said, they're faithless and perverse. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Basically saying, since they can't do it, bring him here. I'll do it myself. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this fountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So why would you tell them that they're faithless and perverse when you said the only way that this kind would go out anyway is by prayer and fasting, which you told them they can't fast because you're with them? I mean, you tell somebody something and then you tie their hands and blame them for not getting the job. You tell them to do something, give them a job. You tie their hands and then you, you criticize them for not getting the job done. Go shovel the snow outside, but you can't use my shovel. And then you go outside and ask them, how come you didn't shovel the walk? How come you didn't shovel the snow outside? <laughs> wow, what did that have to do with being faithless and perverse what what did that have to do with anything he says this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting but you can't fast while i'm with you anyway so that wouldn't even have worked for you because you you don't you you couldn't practice the skill to do it so I'll let y'all think about that one. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. So we're, st we're still talking about, you know, Jesus being so righteous, right? He just criticized people, <laughs> calling them perverse and faithless um, because they couldn't cast out a demon because they were supposed to fast, but he told them they couldn't fast. So I don't know how righteous that was, but... Now we're going to get to the law. Exodus 12 and 22. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. Okay, that's a specific command. Exodus 12, 26 through 27. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. The Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. So it's a ceremony. This is a ritual. This is something that has to be performed every single time you partake in the Passover. Now, we know today, you know, Nobody's putting blood on their door posts or their houses because they're really not sacrificing a goat in their backyard or, or a, a lamb in their yard or nothing like that. So the blood part, I get. But none of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. So let's see what's going on in the New Testament. Now, remember, the temple still stood. So people were really keeping the Passover just as, you know, described in the book of Exodus. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. And why is this important? 
Luke 22, 34 through 40. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Then the disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough. He replied, Jesus went out, <clears throat> Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him on reaching the place. He said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Now, this is the night. Right. This is supposedly Passover night. Right. They have finished the meal. They got to talking and he went out. And this is when it all went down, right? Judas came and, you know, um, basically gave them to the, the, the chief priests and stuff and they took them away, right? So if it was Passover night, why did they go out to the Mount of Olives? Wasn't they supposed to stay in their house? We just read that, right? That was part of the law, right? So what happened here? Was that righteous? Is that breaking the law? Am I reaching? Just reading what it says, right? When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, Matthew 26, 26 through 30. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink, of, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So, is this not Passover night? Is this not the night he instituted this new covenant that the Christians always tell you about that he instituted? You know, take the cup. This is the the whole um, ceremony, right? Drink the wine or his blood, right? This is my blood of the covenant. The bread symbolizes his body, right? This is the Passover night, right? But when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They went out. Did they stay in the house that they were supposed to stay in? No. But we read in the law, that's what they were supposed to do. What happened? Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this, this book of the covenant. Second Kings 23 and 21. The king gave this order to all the people, celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Deuteronomy 16, 5 through 7. You must not sacrifice the Passover in any town the Lord your God gives you, except in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. There you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening when the sun goes down on the anniversary anniversary of your departure from Egypt. Roast it and eat it at the place the Lord your God will choose. Then in the morning, return to your tents. Return to your tent. So where were they? Wherever they chose to eat the sacrifice, that's where they had to stay. So... Then in the morning, return to your tents. Why? Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. In accordance with all its rules and regulations. Numbers 9, 1 through 3. The Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at this appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month at even, you should keep it at its appointed <clears throat> in it, you should keep it in his appointed season according to all the rites of it. 
and according to all the ceremonies thereof shall ye keep it. Numbers 9 and 12. They must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. I'm not even talking about was Jesus the Passover lamb because we know he wasn't a physical lamb to even be sacrificed to begin with. We're talking about them eating the Passover. I really don't even care about him drinking the cup and saying, this is my blood. That's not what I'm talking about. The fact that they were Israelites, they were celebrating the Passover, but they did not stay in the house according to the law. Because it says your king comes to you righteous. That would be unrighteous to break the Passover because you want to sing and go up to the mountain. Because that's not what it says to do. It said, stay in your house. That's what it said. So, again, am I reaching or did they not stay in the house like they were told to? And to celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. Right. If you break one commandment, you break them all, according to the New Testament. Right. So that would mean Jesus and the disciples broke the entire law because they didn't celebrate the Passover correctly. OK. Or am I reaching? <clears throat> In accordance with all its rules and regulations. Right. So that's what it says. So James 2.10 for whoever shall keep the whole law. And yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So Jesus is said to have kept the entire law. He didn't sin one time, right? But if he broke that law, he is guilty of all, according to James 2.10. Galatians 5 and 3. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So if you're circumcised, according to Paul, you are debtor to keep the whole law. Luke 2 and 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Jesus was circumcised, so he would be a debtor to keep the whole law, according to Galatians 5 and 3. Or am I reaching? Am I making stuff up? Or was Paul not talking about Jesus? Just anybody else who wants to be circumcised. Even though Jesus was circumcised. So. Or was James not talking about Jesus? Because he was Jesus, you know, he, Jesus could do what he want. You know, he's son of God or to the, some Christians, you know, he is God. He can do whatever he want to. Right. OK, well, let's see what the law says about that. That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. So can you do whatever you want to do just because you are a Messiah or even a king? Deuteronomy 17, 18, 18 through 20. Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one above from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom and he and his children in the midst of Israel. So a few, di a few different points that we got to bring out in this. First, it says when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, where is that on earth? He shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. Nobody ever talks about Jesus having his own copy of the law written down from the one before the priests. The priests have to basically uh, make sure it's a kosher copy. 
the Levites specifically, not the order of Melchizedek priests, the Levites, it says the Levites, and it shall be with him. It shall be with him. Nobody talks about Jesus walking around with a scroll or, you know, he went to the synagogue to read, but it says it shall be with him. Now, of course, he's not on the throne of his kingdom, so that kind of don't apply to him because he wasn't a king to begin with. And he shall read it all the days of his life that he may be that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. Now, you notice this king has brethren. I don't think the Most High has brethren, okay? But it says that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. So that means he can't do whatever he wants. And he can't turn aside from the right hand to the left. So he was supposed to keep the entire law. He can't do what he wants. That he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel, not in some other place. In the midst of Israel, his kingdom shall be in the midst of Israel among his brethren, not in some place that Jesus told Pilate his kingdom ain't part of this world. So that's from the law. Was Jesus executed on Passover or on the preparation day before the Sabbath or the high Sabbath in this specific uh, time frame? Matthew 26 and 17. On the first day of the festival, of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So this would be before the sun goes down. Deuteronomy 16, 6, except in the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, there you must sacrifice the Passover in the evening when the sun goes down on the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. So when exactly was Jesus executed? If he was a symbolic lamb or Passover lamb, this should have taken place at sundown, not early in the afternoon when the sun is still in the middle of the sky. According to John, it says it was the day of preparation of the Passover. Now, John 13, 1 through 2 says it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. So this is the day before, right? Because he's in, he doesn't get executed until after they eat, they go into the garden, and then that next day when he's brought in front of uh, Pilate, that's when they actually execute him. So John 19, 14, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. So that would mean they ate that meal the day before, okay? It was about noon, here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. So if it was the preparation day of the Passover, and they had already eaten the night before, then he wouldn't be classified as a Passover lamb because he didn't do it on the right day, if that's where the Christians are trying to take you with that. John 19, 30 to 31. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So if it was a preparation of the Passover, if that day was the preparation day of the Passover itself, then that means that night would have been Passover. They're preparing for it, then the next night would have been Passover. But if they had already eaten it but before that, then he wouldn't have been executed on that exact Passover. So depending on which gospel you're reading, you know, you can kind of decide where you want to go with that. So just something to think about. He did not come for salvation yet. So when it says he has salvation, right? He's, he's humble, 
righteous and riding on a donkey and has salvation. Well, Hebrews 9 and 28 says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So when it says your king is righteous and having salvation, he didn't have salvation because it says in Hebrews that ain't what he came for this time. Luke 1, 69 through 71. He was raised up. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Uh, no, he didn't. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. That didn't happen when Jesus was on earth. He actually said you're going to die for him and they were going to persecute you and kill you and all these things. So that doesn't sound like a king having salvation for you or somebody who was raised up as a horn of salvation from the house of David when he tells you you're going to die for him instead of him actually saving you from the hand of your enemies and those who hate you. They got to actually kill you and continue to hate you. The blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. So if Jesus was this righteous and humble king, according to the account that, you know, he fulfills Zechariah 9 and 9, what exactly happened during his time on earth? Because in Galatians 3.14, it says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Was this a physical reality or defined by whatever you think it is? Luke 17.20-21. And when he was demanded or <clears throat> and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So he's saying you don't even know when the kingdom of God is going to be here because it doesn't come with observation. You can't see it. It's within you. So anybody can take that and make it to whatever they want. Some people can say it's peace of mind. It's how you feel. Well, I have peace, even though you don't have peace. Nobody's bothering me, even though somebody's bothering you. That's not the kingdom of God. That's not the, the, the wolf laying down with the sheep. That's not peace on earth. That's not kids playing on the hole of snakes. That's not Isaiah chapter 11. Okay, that's not how that works. You can't just make it into whatever you want it to be. And it is going to come with observation. People are going to see it. Because it says in Ezekiel 37, all the nations will know that I am the Lord in your midst. When I put up my tabernacle. And I be with you at that tabernacle. Read Ezekiel 37, 24 through 28. That is with observation. So I don't know what he's talking about right here. So this wouldn't even fit with Zechariah 9 and 9. Because if he's supposed to speak peace to the nations, if it doesn't come with observation, what kind of peace is that? Nobody even knows it's peace? Or is it supposed to be an end of war? Or whatever you think it is. I'll let y'all deal with that. So if he is lowly and righteous and riding on a donkey and having salvation, what kind of salvation is this? Luke 10, 19. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. That sounds like that could be some salvation, right? But Matthew 24 and 9 says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me, because of me. We just read in Luke, you're supposed to be saved from those who hate you. 
So why would you be handed over and persecuted by these same people that Luke said you came to save them from? Acts 12, 1 through 2. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church or the Christians, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. I thought nothing will harm you, according to Luke 10, 19. What happened? How did the ch church get persecuted if they had power over all the enemy is what it says. It says to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. So they were persecuted and James, the brother of John, was put to death with the sword. Sound like he was harmed. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. How are you going to get saved from wrath when he says that they're going to kill you and persecute you? These same people who hate you. First Thessalonians 1 and 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Was that the wrath that the Romans brought when they came and started the wars and destroyed the temple? Or is this in the future? When exactly was Jesus supposed to save from the wrath to come? Because remember, he didn't come for salvation this time. According to the book of Hebrews, he came to bear sin. So when exactly is he going to save you from the wrath to come when the Romans came with that wrath? First Thessalonians 2.16 Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. What wrath came upon these people? But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. What wrath did they see? Was it wrath of God? Was it the wrath of the Romans? What wrath was this? Revelations 20 and 4. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. When was this? Because Romans says we shall be saved from wrath through him. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. How did these people get beheaded if they were supposed to be spared from this wrath to come? That's not uh, righteous in having salvation. There is no salvation there. So if everything is supposed to be after he returns, then your king did not come to you with salvation. He wasn't a king in the first place, but he didn't come riding on a donkey and have a salvation. So again, Zechariah 9 and 9 would not apply now. And it's, it's always, oh, in the future, in the future. Well, Zechariah 9 and 9 says, it says it was fulfilled. So only the part of him riding on the donkey was fulfilled. And you got to cross out the rest of the verses or what's going on. You, you can't cherry pick like that. By finishing the work you gave me to do. John 17, 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. What work was he supposed to do? Isaiah 11 and 4 says, But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Where's this righteousness? Where's this judgment? What happened to the whole chapter of Isaiah chapter 11 in general? I mean, if he's finished with the work you gave me to do, what well, is he supposed to just come and preach? Because in John 17, 4, he hasn't even been executed yet. So I thought he was supposed to come and die and all these other things and break up the works of the devil. Right. But he said he's finished right here in John. So I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. 
Was that just to go around and preach? Or is that actually to gather Israel, which you didn't do? They actually got scattered. So we examine Zechariah 9 and 9 and actually read the New Testament. We see it just it doesn't fit. Matthew has another false fulfillment citation. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. So, of course, the Christians will try to apply Isaiah 11 to Jesus, right? But Isaiah 11 and 9 says, They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So if they can't harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, how did this happen in John 11, 48? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and, the, when the Roman, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. That's exactly what happened. So harm and destruction did come. That happened. So how does your king come to you with salvation riding on a donkey when this happened? And it says everyone will believe in him. So, of course, the Christians will say, you know, he was rejected. That's why the, that's why Jerusalem was destroyed, because Israel didn't believe in the Messiah. But these people say everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So did the people believe in him? And that's why the Romans came or did they reject him? <laughs> Which one was it? Which one was it? Your house is left to you desolate. That doesn't sound like a speech from somebody who has salvation telling you in Matthew 23, 38, look, your house is left to you desolate. Luke 21, 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. That's not somebody who's supposed to be bringing you salvation. Zechariah 9 and 10, the very next verse, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen or the nations. When did Jesus speak peace to the heathen or nations or Gentiles? He didn't do that part, but he did Zechariah 9 and 9 rode the donkey and came with salvation that he didn't have? No. Gather the exiles of Israel, Isaiah 11 and 12. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. James 1 and 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Isaiah 11 could not have been fulfilled by Jesus because the twelve tribes were scattered, according to James 1 and 1. What happened? That doesn't sound like he came with that salvation. Couldn't have if the, the tribes were scattered. What happened? If he was going to speak peace to the nations, they wouldn't have scattered Israel. According to Zechariah 9 and 10. So he couldn't have fulfilled it. Zechariah 9 and 9 or 10. Right? So Zechariah 9 and 9 has a couple of different uh, translations. So Holman Christian Standard Bible says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Victorious. Victorious of what? Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey, the foal of a donkey. Contemporary English version, everyone in Jerusalem celebrate and shout, Your king has won a victory. He is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey, and he comes on the colt of a donkey. There goes again the word victory. Berean study Bible. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious. 
humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So these translations have the word victory where the word salvation is, which neither occurred. There was no victory and there was no salvation. So they wouldn't apply to Jesus either way. Zechariah 9 and 9, New Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So again, even the Catholic version said he was triumphant and victorious, but of what? He hasn't died yet at this point. People still sinning. The Romans are still going to come and destroy and kill people and, and exile people. And we ain't even talking about the Crusades and the Inquisitions coming down the pipe. Like, this is not triumphant and victorious at all in the time frame of when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So now we can actually examine Zechariah 9 and 9 in a little bit more detail. At this point, it doesn't matter, but just, you know, to be a little bit more thorough. Two animals are listed in the book of Matthew, Matthew 21 and 2, saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. So he says, a donkey tie and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. You're going to see where I'm going in a second. So here's the full context. Matthew 21, 4 through 7. New Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. This took place to fulfill what he has spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. So is he riding two animals at the same time? Did he ride on one and get off and ride on the other one? How did that work? One animal in the book of John John 12, 14 through 15, New Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. So now Jesus find, found it. Um, sending people to get stuff, Jesus found it. That doesn't even really matter because, you know, it can be argued that he told them where to find it. So it can be accredited to that he actually found it, right? Okay. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So it just says he found a young donkey. Nothing about the mother, right? Not a young colt with her, like it says in Matthew. John 12, 14 through 15, New International Version. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Right? Okay. So there's no mother like the previous verse in Matthew. Just one animal, not two. He didn't sit on them. Right? That's not what John says. One animal, Mark 11 and 2, and said unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied. Whoever, excuse me, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. There's not two animals there. Mark 11 and 4. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. And they loose him. He's by himself. Mark 11, 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he sat upon him him so there's no more two animals now there's just one animal so <clears throat> if we deal with zechariah 9 and 9 
what happens if we read the verse before that? But I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Zechariah 9 and 8. But I will encamp at my temple to guard it against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now I am keeping watch. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now I am keeping watch. I will encamp at my temple. Hmm. Matthew 24 and 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this cannot be the time frame of Jesus because he's telling you, he's telling you the temple is going to be destroyed. But in Zechariah 9 and 8 says, I will encamp at my temple to guard against it marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. How is that possible if Jesus tells you that the temple will be destroyed when the Most High said he's going to keep watch over it? This is not the same time frame. One verse before, not a chapter, one verse. It doesn't fit. Let's go to the verse after. Let's go to Zechariah 9 and 10. The battle bow shall be cut off. Zechariah 9 and 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen. How did he speak peace unto the heathen when they're the ones who destroyed the temple? They were probably upset is why they did that, right? And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. How can that be him when his kingdom is not part of this world? Right? Right? War has not ended. Matthew 24 and 6. And ye shall wear and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So if the battle bow is gonna be cut off, the horse from Jerusalem, peace is supposed to be spoken to the nations. How is that the time frame of Jesus when he says you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars? It's not the same time frame. One verse after, not the same time frame. You see how they cherry pick a verse and riding on a donkey and hyped it like, yeah, she fulfilled prophecy. What's the context? What's going on? Right? What's happening? When you look at these things, they're just not adding up. The math is not there. The battle bow shall be cut off, right? Matthew 23, 38. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Luke 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. The battle bow is not cut off. That cannot apply. It just can't apply. It doesn't work. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen or the nations or the Gentiles. Zechariah 9 and 10, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. So what happened to he shall speak peace unto the heathen? Mark 7, 27, but Jesus said unto her, let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. Yes, um, this is a, a woman who is not an Israelite, and Jesus basically called her a dog. Matthew 10, 34, think not I am come to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. So again, that's not uh, speaking peace to the nations. And if you came to bring a sword, some will say, you know, the sword of his mouth. He's teaching them about the law. But actually, he didn't come to bring peace. He actually brought division and uh, 
said the temple was going to be destroyed. So there's nothing peaceful about any of that. He was arguing with the Pharisees the whole time. That's not peace. Um, he didn't speak peace to Herod. He didn't speak peace to the Romans or the heathen or the Gentiles. Actually, remember, he said, don't even go to the Gentiles at first. Remember, don't be like the Gentiles. They just be babbling when they pray, you know. Um, he, he doesn't say too many things that are favorable towards non-Jews or Gentiles. So when did he speak peace into the heathen? If it's going to be in the future, then don't say this was fulfilled. They're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to say, well, you know, we didn't say Zechariah 9 and 10 was fulfilled. But Zechariah 9 and 9 says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. So that means when that king comes, that's when, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. Because if he's going to put it into war, he's going to have to do that by speaking peace unto the Gentiles. Saw so part of the same scenario. So let's continue. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Matthew 10, 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into, in, <clears throat> and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. How are you going to speak peace to the Gentiles if you're not even allowed to go and preach there? Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you and you gained your brother, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a Gentile and a tax collector. So that means somebody that, you know, you pretty much you're cool on. Because he's basically saying, let them be to you like somebody you cool on. And he compare the Gentile or the heathen and the tax collector to somebody you would be cool on. Like somebody you don't have any dealings with. That's not speaking peace to the Gentiles. That's basically ignoring them like you don't have no business with them. So that's not speaking peace to the heathen or the Gentiles. So that scenario does not work. His dominion shall be from sea even to sea. So again, in Zechariah 9 and 10, talks about his dominion and the boundaries. And in John 18, 36, it says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. How are you going to have a dominion from sea to sea if your kingdom ain't no part of this world? So, Zechariah 9 and 10 does not fit Jesus. Zechariah 9 and 9 does not fit Jesus. Zechariah 9 and 8 does not fit Jesus. So, the whole context surrounding Zechariah 9 and 9 does not apply to the time frame or the things Jesus dealt with during his lifetime. So, they cherry-picked the part about riding on a donkey and even Matthew messed that up so let's continue them that were beheaded for the witnesses of Jesus Zechariah 9 and 13 when I have bent Judah for me filled the bow with Ephraim and raised up thy sons O Zion against thy sons O Greece and made thee as a sword of a mighty man so <clears throat> Zechariah 9 and 13 definitely is not the time frame of Jesus because the sons of Zion against the sons of Greece. So some people will say, well, this is the Maccabean period because that's when Israel actually fought the Greeks. This is where the story of Hanukkah comes from, mentioned in John chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. So this is not the time frame of Jesus. Because remember, Revelation 20 and 4, and I saw and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Remember, it says your king comes to you with salvation and victorious riding on a donkey. That's not salvation getting your head cut off. 
for somebody who was supposed to save you from the wrath to come, according to Paul. So the whole context around Zechariah chapter 9 is just not in the cards for Jesus besides the donkey or two, depending on if you want to go with Matthew or a different gospel. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, Zechariah 9, 14 through 15. The Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning. And the Lord God shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them. They shall devour and subdue with sling stones. They shall drink and make a noise as through wine. They shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar. This is not what happened in the time frame of Jesus. Israel was not defended. The temple was destroyed. The people were scattered. So he could not have come with salvation just to be overthrown by the Romans. That wouldn't make any sense. So Zechariah 9, 8 through 15, they just don't apply to Jesus. The Lord their God shall save them in that day, Zechariah 9, 16, and the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. So, if that's the case, what happened in Acts 26.10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice, my voice against them. So how was Paul able to put people in prison and put them to death if Jesus came with salvation? He didn't have salvation. And according to the book of Hebrews, he didn't even come to bring salvation. So he wouldn't have been the king coming with salvation riding on that donkey. So just using a little logic here, Zechariah 9, 8 through 16, do not fit the time frame of Jesus, especially when we look at the events that took place during that time using the New Testament. Conclusion. Zechariah 9 and 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. There was not much to rejoice about, right? Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two brother, two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What is a tax collector? Helps word studies, 5057. Tolonis, a publican, a tax collector, gathering public taxes from the Jews for the Romans. So Jesus says, let this person be to you as a tax collector, somebody taxing the Jews on behalf of the Romans. That is not nothing to rejoice about. That is nothing to be happy about. And that's definitely not salvation if you have Romans in your land taxing you. So again, this time frame does not work for the New Testament trying to say it was fulfilled. It doesn't work. Your king is coming to you. Zechariah 9 and 9, behold, your king is coming to you. Well, Jesus was not a king. Herod was the king of Judea. He did not want to be king when the people came in to make him the king. And then he told Pilate his kingdom was not part of this world. How exactly does that work? If you go to get sworn in as president and you say, well, I'm not the president of this country. My country is not part of this world. Would you really get sworn in as the president of your country if your country is not part of this world, but you live in that specific country? They probably wouldn't think you were the president, or at least you wouldn't be acting like one. So he was not a king coming to anybody. Doesn't work.
righteous and having salvation, Zechariah 9 and 9. Was he righteous and having salvation? He broke the Passover law and no one saw the salvation from their enemies. He told his believers they would die for him. And he told the non-believers they would be damned if they didn't believe in him. Read Mark chapter 16. Which we know Mark 16, 9 through 20 really was an addition, but it's there. So, you know, if you accept that, you know, it's there. So still no salvation and wasn't so righteous having the people not fast when he was with them, even though he was fasting. And the Pharisees said to fast and he said, listen to the Pharisees, but I guess that didn't apply when it came to them fasting. I don't know. But I gave you all the verses and the sources, so I'll let you decide that for yourself. Humble, Zechariah 9 and 9. Was he humble? Um, well, he's arguing with people the whole time, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes you rebuke people, sometimes you get rebuked. So, you know, arguing is not necessarily, you know, a crime. Woe to the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrites, right? He's, he's having some uh, dialogue with the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests at that time. So that's one thing. But Luke 19, 27 is kind of interesting. It says, but these mine enemies that would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. You know, there's there's different commentaries on this, but this is what Barnes notes on the Bible says. But those mine enemies, by the punishment of those who would not that he should reign over them, is denoted the ruin that was to come upon the Jewish nation for rejecting the Messiah, and also upon all sinners for not receiving him as their king. Why would they receive him as their king when he did not come with salvation and save them from their enemies and his kingdom is not part of this world? Slay them before me? I thought you were supposed to be the savior. I thought you were supposed to save the world. Oh, it's only for those who believed in you, but you didn't give no reason to believe in you. You was doing miracles. So what? Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 13 tells you false prophets can do miracles. That doesn't make you a Messiah. Even Jesus himself said false prophets will arise and do miracles to mislead the elect. So miracles is not a sign of any type of legitimate prophethood. That's not what gets it. It's actually giving the people salvation from their enemies. Gathering Israel, rebuilding the temple, bringing peace to the world. Everything that you didn't do, Jesus. Or those who believe in him. Right? I mean... Slay them before me? The Savior saying, slay them before me? Because they don't want him to be king? Why? Because you didn't do nothing. Herod was the king, and he mocked you and ridiculed you and dressed you up. you That's not what the Messiah is supposed to He ain't supposed to get down like that. Oh, he was humble. Well, you know what? You can be humble, but you don't have to be a punk. Right? You're supposed to be the person who slays the wicked with their mouth, according to the prophecy. Why didn't you do that, at least? You're talking about slaying the people who don't want to bow down to you when you had every chance to be king for 33 years. Well, not the whole 33 years, because you can't be a king. Well, I guess Solomon was a king when he was like 12. But you had a chance to do it, but you didn't do it. You said you came to die for the people and did nothing change. When you, before you was born, the Romans was there. After you died, the Romans was there. Then they destroyed the temple. So why should people call you a king when you ain't even around to be a king? Doesn't make any sense. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Matthew 5 and 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council or the Sanhedrin. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Matthew 23, 17, 
you blind fools for which is greater the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred so jesus would be liable to the hell of fire because he calls somebody a fool is that humility is that righteous obviously not if you liable to the hell of fire right so some things you got to consider riding on a donkey on a coat the foal of a donkey Zechariah 9 and 9 Humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the fall of a donkey. According to the Gospels, Jesus did ride on a donkey or two. But that's about it. So thanks for listening. Subscribe to the channel, Clouds of Torah. Hit the thumbs up. Get some likes in the building. Um, check out the other videos, the False Fulfillment Citation Series clausatora.com and uh grab a book or two on amazon davon mays the false fulfillment citation series and uh get at me at davon mays at clausatora.com for questions and comments